Good evening, everybody. Uh, Congressman Blakemore here. Sorry if you had to listen to a little bit of hold music. Um, we're uh, we're just doing a dial out so we can get more folks on. So we are ready to rock and roll. Thank you for joining tonight. I know um, many many people have called in actually, not just accepted a phone call from us. So thank you for for um, following along and being willing to to spend some time tonight. Okay, so if you have a question, please hit star three. I'll take a few minutes to go over what my team and I have been doing on behalf of Utah's First District, and then we'll, we'll open the phone lines to start asking questions. Again, question: if you have a question, star three at any time. We'll periodically do a quick poll, uh, so I can get a, you know, keep getting a pulse on, on how folks are feeling about things. To stay up to date on my activities and updates from Washington and First District, please subscribe to our newsletter. It is the thing that we put the most effort into on a weekly basis to communicate to you all. Um, there's social media and all that, but we really put the most effort into that newsletter and appreciate folks for following along. We don't spam, it's one email a week and really appreciate people willing to, to jump onto that. Visit our website at www.blakemore.house.gov to get subscribed. Again, our Twitter or our, our social media handler is at Rep Blakemore. And keep uh, keep up to date with all of the, the updates and any up events that we're having, district meetings, legislative efforts, and so on. Uh, my team and I are here to be a resource for you. If you hear anything tonight you'd like more information on or help navigating a federal agency or would like to schedule a meeting, please reach out. The most productive work and exciting work we can do is, is to help folks um, you know, go through, help them navigate uh, the Social Security or passports or things like that. Um, number for our Ogden office, 801-625-0107. And, um, you know, please just uh, to reach out with any questions and we'll do our very best to, to get responses back to folks and help them navigate anything. As, as we're continuing to get some people dialing in, I'll give you a brief overview of what we've been up to and then get right to questions. We had what I felt like is a very productive summer, um, full of district outreach. We had in-person town halls in virtually all of our counties, um, still working on getting everywhere. We had to come back in the middle of August. Um, Speaker Pelosi called us back into emergency session. And so we had to reschedule our cash in Box Elder County town halls for October, but please join those. And we have more even in November. It's been, a, it's been an awesome part of this um, role to be able to get out and do those. And um, please keep it up to date. Again, following the newsletter or checking on online when those are. But again, we have rescheduled cash and box elder county. Our Ogden staff held mobile office hours in the ten, in all ten counties throughout the summer, where constituents brought their casework questions, comments straight to Team Moore. Our summer roundtable series, something I was really excited about, was also very successful. Hosted several roundtable discussions on a variety of issues from immigration. Housing, Second Amendment, cybersecurity, and we've got more on the way coming up. I really appreciate when experts in each of these fields will join, give their input on the challenges Utahns face. It really helps me out understand um, a variety of issues that go on. I, I'm really trying hard to bring productive solutions uh, to the federal level. It's not always easy. Uh, I think if you've followed along and you've seen, there's uh, you know there's, there's there's so much going on. There's so much that Congress can be doing better for the American people, and I am I'm trying to dig in and, and identify those solutions. Um, I've really enjoyed, you know, as I talk about the summer, got out to a lot of rodeos and parades and picnics. Thanks for everybody. Got a, it was a great chance to, to interact with folks. For my first day in office, my team and I have been working with Hill Air Force Base, military families, and the Utah's defense community to ensure that Utah's priorities are represented in the National Defense Authorization Act. After a 17-hour Armed Services Committee hearing and a marathon of votes today, the NDA passed the House that just actually got, I just left my vote there, um, passed the House with several of my provisions included. These will directly benefit Utah's defense community, including the full funding of the ground-based strategic deterrent at Hill Air Force Base, language from my recent Afghanistan Accountability Act to identify the breakdown of information given to the President ahead of the Afghanistan withdrawal, decisions made by the President, Improvements in veteran hiring, reciprocity for military spouse professional licensing, increases to remote site pay allowance, and more. Uh, as Utah's sole representative on the Armed Services Committee, I was pleased to bring results to our integral defense community and military families. And I'll continue to advocate for Hill Air Force Base, the larger defense community, 
as this legislation moves through the Senate and, and conference as the conference progress as uh, and the conference process. Um, I have sincerely loved getting out and and being in the district. August was usually a mostly a district work time. We had more time back in DC than I had anticipated, but we did use as much time as possible again to get out and do those town halls and, and interact with people. So um Again, website, blakemore.house.gov. And um, please, again, for Box Elder and Cash folks, when, and Weaver and Davis, too, we have, we have two more town halls coming up in November there, too. So just keep an eye on things, and we'll, um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep interacting. So we're going to jump to questions. Uh, so again, if you have a question, press star 3 to be entered into the queue. And the first question is Gloria from Layton. Gloria, are you on? I'm here, yes. Go ahead. My question was, if no one is above the law, how is it that the President of the United States is breaking the law with each and every um, illegal that comes across the border without permission? All right. Now, we have a major crisis on the border right now, and we've talked about this at every town hall. Um, there's a... Uh, it's, it's 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 complex. It's a complex issue, but the solutions should be so much more simple. And what I'm really disappointed in with the Biden administration and and Vice President Harris is an unwillingness to look at what's worked in the past and what's been successful, and and um, actually address the issue. Uh, the Supreme Court recently stepped in for the Remain in Mexico policy. That was a good policy. That wasn't. That that's something that has to be addressed, and for the Supreme Court to have to come in and sort of force it along, and for the Biden administration not to be able to recognize what what should be done, it's really concerning. Um, I it, it it's it's um, yeah, I hear my colleague and all so many you know colleagues from a state like Montana where there's been more more um, Im immigrants coming in illegally than like the entire population of some of our states. So this is a major concern and you are not seeing the president um, take leadership here. And I was, and this is, this is one of a handful of things that there's just this expectation that everything will be fine and we don't have to have like an actual plan or strategic plan to go do it. You could, you could relay it to, you know, an energy policy or the Afghanistan um, crisis, and there was just like almost like a hope for, in my opinion. And so, yes, I agree. The frustration is legitimate. This isn't just a, you know, a thing that's messaged on well, right-leaning media. Um, there are mayors on border towns in Texas, Democrat mayors, that are furious at the administration right now. Um, and so, uh, the, the the policies need to be put in place. And I'll reiterate: may, remain in Mexico policy, pace the program. We need to disincentivize border crossing so cartels don't have sort of like a, a carrot to, 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 to bring people across if they think there's going to be a willingness just to accept um, illegal immigration. We have to have our um, border enhancements. We've got to secure the border. Securing the border is part of a greater plan as well to streamline our visa program. We have many industries across the board that need this workforce of legal immigration. Um, and in Utah, I've heard loud and clear from, from our chambers of commerce and everybody. So we are engaged on this issue. I will point you to a couple people, August Fluger and, um, and Tony Gonzalez. They are excellent members down, freshman, freshman colleagues of mine from Texas, very credible sources. Um, they understand this issue even more than I do, uh, than a lot of us, just because they've dealt with this for so long. Um, I, I, I encourage you to also look at what they're doing, what they're communicating. They're awesome, awesome people that want to see and change here. So heard, understood, and, and um, we need leadership. Um, okay, next question is David from Ogden. Yes, Representative. I uh, see uh, <clears throat> go OHS uh, Tigers. Go there Aggies. You go. Tigers. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Gamsam Hamdida, for doing this tonight. Um, my question is, uh, what are we going to do about looking into the uh, um, 
loss of equipment in Afghanistan, the 80 billion, 85 billion, 90 billion, whatever the number is, and specifically about the confidential, top secret uh, information and equipment software in radios and the biometrics. This is a huge deal that uh, Taliban can can sell that information and technology to China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and then our military communication equipment is then compromised. Thank you, David. Um, this this was, and if you've seen anything that we've put out, this was overwhelming to just our own team. Utah First District. I wouldn't have anticipated so much connection to folks in Afghanistan when all this went down. We we worked countless hours doing our part to navigate this. Um, there needs to the State Department was inept in this entire process. I, I look first and foremost to to that key piece. Um, so I could talk about Afghanistan for a long time. Let me get to your exact question. Um, that uh, so there is an equipment report that's required in the NDAA that just passed about an hour ago. Uh, we put together an, what was called the Afghanistan, Afghanistan Accountability Act. And, and that was a 20-page bill that had multiple facets to it that could go into armed services-related items, could go into foreign, or foreign affairs, could go into the intelligence community. And we, were, we, we have been working to sort of take pieces from that and in, implement that into these various committees of jurisdiction where they can, um, they, they, they will be able to hold their hearings and the accountability piece will begin. We've already had some initial uh, hearings in the Senate. They were mostly grandstanding and then we didn't get a chance to get to the bottom of it. What I am, what I am, what will take place out of the NDAA, I'll use the term, again, the defense bill that we just passed, there is equipment report. There is pieces of the accountability to assess the intelligence that was known and what decisions were made. Um, all of that is um, was a huge focus of that 17-hour meeting. Uh, a huge chunk of that was what was going to be accountable. I am pleased to also say, you know, there are many Democrats that are furious about this, and many Democrats that were speaking out and against their administration clear back in April about, you know, not having a plan and not having the right strategy going forward. It wasn't about whether to leave Afghanistan, 20 years and $2 trillion of taxpayer money. Like, there's that. that's not the debate, in my opinion. The debate was, why are we doing this by 9-11? Why are we doing this by, you know, a 20th anniversary? My, my issue was always with the timeline. And we saw that completely be a debacle and an enormous crisis. And so, what are the two bad, the two worst things that happened from that? We lost 13 service members, and then we were rushed because we didn't have the intelligence capability based on the haphazard way we did that. The, the Biden administration did this. We fired a drone strike with bad information that wasn't accurate, and we and there was, and it still details will still be able to to to, to dig into this. But civilians were were killed because of you know our haphazard approach that led us to making um, you know, bad decisions on on that attack and you know those things are a heart wrenching but infuriating with what we've done. So the equipment um, and the you know what there will be this will be sold and you know bartered with and China is a complete bad actor in this realm and we need to hold those accountable. So all of that is going into the NDA process. There will be um, an intense focus on this in the months and months to come. Uh, that all, it is, that's why it's so important for that National Defense Authorization Act to pass, and it got uh, huge bipartisan support tonight to be able to get it done. Um, okay, so again, star three, if you have a question. And we're gonna go to, oh, and star six for the newsletter. So star three for a question, star six for a newsletter. We're going to Gary from Garland. Yeah, yeah, you there? Yeah. That's, and uh, okay. last one, that's anything about Bicom Air Force, Air Force Base and uh, uh, our embassy. We've also lost. There's a multi-billion dollars there. Yep. But, uh, but my, my question was about uh, border integrity. Um, all these other problems could be solved if, we, if, if they 
get there some voter integrity. Do you what do you plan to do about that? Yep, I've been engaged on this issue from the very start, and um, I feel like I've been able to create a pretty credible voice on this. One thing I'm really excited about is um, the ranking member of the House administration, who deals with a lot of election measures, has heard me talk incessantly about Utah and the awesome state that it is, but the process that we go through for an election election integrity that we have. Election integrity, but also inclusiveness. We see over the years, we've seen an enormous amount of folks uh, embrace the elections. We've seen Republicans and um, conservative candidates do very well. Um, and you can have an election system that is inclusive, um, that is also very, very secure. And so this individual is actually coming to Utah in a couple of weeks. He's coming to sit down with, um, several of our county's election clerks. It, it, yeah, this is something I'm really excited about, to be honest with you, because I love the way Utah does a lot of things, and it's definitely one of them. This is a great model for the rest of the country, and um, we're, we're going to be able to communicate you know, what our best practices are, I believe, in federalism immensely. That's why I'm so opposed to H.R. 1 and H.R. 4. Those are bills that would um, kind of federalize our elections. Um, we don't handle this well at the federal level, and we need our we need our counties to have best practices. And I think that this is uh, this is one of those neat things that's happened in Congress, where I've I've been able to talk to colleagues about it, ex you know, explain where we are, what we do, um, and I think we've got a good model to share with the rest of the country. So that is what I'm actually doing about it, and it's something that I'm really excited about. So, um, okay, we're gonna do a poll question now. So thank you for the question. So we're gonna do a poll question. Um, and you're just going to push one to seven. We have seven options here. I'll get through this quickly because I love getting to these questions, everybody. So uh, just real quick on a poll question. Which issue do you think should be Congress's top priority? Press one for inflation. Two for immigration. Three for infrastructure. Four for Afghanistan crisis. Five for stabilizing Medicare and Social Security. Six for pro-life values and seven for other. I'm going to say it again so you've heard all the answers. Inflation, one. Immigration, two. Infrastructure, three. Afghanistan crisis, four. Stabilizing Medicare and Social Security, five. Pro-life values, six. Other, seven. Go ahead and participate. That'd be great. All right, Ken. Ken from Logan. Starting banking, um, my understanding there's a bill being presented that for any transaction, $600 or more is to be reported. Is that correct? That is in the works, and I'm glad you bring it up because we, um, Congressman Tom Emmer and I, have begun messaging hard against this, and um, so let me... I, I, I've got I've got it actually in front of me here because we just put some of this communication out there. Um, this is something that the financial institutions have come to us. So the basic concept is like the privacy concerns, extra costs associated with it. The Democrats they're they're trying to give um, the IRS info on our basic transactions. This is an attempt to try to you know, find out where there's stuff going on where they can go and collect more revenue. Um, to pay for some of the spending, so it's a whole, the whole big mess. I've got a statement out that we've come out very strongly against this, and we're going to obviously be watching this and and pushing hard against it. Um, I'm going to read the whole. No, yeah, I, I don't want to. If, if, if you're particularly interested in this, we put information out about this. We make sure that it's in our newsletter, um, but it is. Just quickly, the proposal would require financial institutions to that, that they provide certain transaction level at $600, and our financial institutions were just amazed by this and very, very upset. The requirements for this proposal would impose significant compliance costs on our banks, credit unions, and related institutions, but fringe on privacy of Americans. So we're hard out against this. Tom Emmer is a credible voice in this, and we joined him on a letter, and we're gonna we're gonna keep monitoring it and, and fighting it. 
Um, this is something that I would see having a very very tough time, um, you know, getting through with um, with the bipartisan support that would be needed. Uh, and we're, we'll keep monitoring it. So thanks for bringing that up and paying attention to that because those are the kind of things that can be by folks sometimes, so I appreciate it.